Hey folks, welcome to the channel. David here. You guys know I play mandolin, and today we're talking about one of the most important tools in a mandolin player's toolbox, or any musician's toolbox for that instance. Today we're talking about music memorization. So here's what we're in for. Throughout this video, I'm going to show you the reasons why we should memorize music. Then we're going to take a look at the challenges to memorization, as well as seeing how memorization and music can be broken up into four different categories. And I'll show you how I use these four different categories to more thoroughly memorize music, to get better performance results, and just to enjoy playing music a lot more. But not only that, Towards the end of this video, I'll give you some more practical bonus memorization tips. So whenever you're ready, let's get into it. And chances are, if you're watching a video with a title like this, you probably already know the benefits of memorization. But just for good measure, let me recap a few really important reasons why internalizing music is so important. And first up is mobility. You know, kind of obviously memorization frees you up to play anywhere, anytime with anyone, and there's no greater musical freedom than that. Second is experience. When you have your music memorized, it's so much easier to lose yourself in the experience of the performance and just enjoy the ride without overthinking things. And number three is your performance, right? When you have your music memorized correctly, Correctly, it automatically kicks your performance up a notch. And things like playing fast or playing with more precision, playing more confidently, all that comes in tow. Also, it just gives you a lot more mental space to think about your own playing, think about how you're adding to the jam, how you're adding to the ensemble, all sorts of things. And lastly, there's just kind of an expectation, especially for mandolinists to memorize the music that they play, even if you're not a professional. You know, with the exception of maybe classical or more orchestrated styles, most of the music that we play on the mandolin come from oral traditions, where things were passed down from generation to generation by ear without recorded or written reference. So in order to play this instrument, you kind of had to learn how to memorize the music that you played. And even today, as you get into more intermediate or advanced jam circles, most of the folks at an old time, bluegrass, Celtic, or other types of jams, they they won't have sheet music in front of them. They won't have tab, they won't have chord charts. The expectation is that you either know the repertoire by heart or you're gonna be proficient enough on your instrument to figure out a song by ear in the moment as the song is played in the jam. And that expectation is a little scary, right? But I think it's good to have some social precedent and some outside accountability to push us further on our instrument here. So those are the reasons that we're here, but in my experience as a music teacher, I know so many students still struggle with this aspect. And I think the number one bump in the road to memorizing music, for us mandolin players at least, is having a dependency on the tab. You know, we love the tablature, right? <laughs> now, I know a lot of people in the mandolin community throw shade on learning music through tablature, but honestly, I don't know if it's necessarily a bad learning medium. In fact, I learned most of the stuff that I know from tablature, and you might know I now make a living offering tab and standard notation transcriptions through my Patreon page. Link in the cards above. But those transcriptions are supposed to be a means to an end, to help us learn a tune quickly so that we can internalize it on our own from there. So if you're always practicing with the tab or the sheet music in front of you, it can quickly become a crutch. I don't know if you know that feeling where you feel like you have a tune memorized, but you can't play through it from memory unless that sheet music is right there on the music stand as a safety net. And that's not a good thing. Which brings us to our next challenge, which is having the discipline to actually sit down, to take the transcription away, and just memorize. And I'm talking to myself here more than anyone. It takes a lot of sweat and focus to actually memorize a tune bit by bit, when it's way more fun just to sit down and play through the entire tune from start to finish with the transcription in front of you. But like we mentioned earlier, that's not going to really help us in this department. And if we're not dedicating time to memorizing in our practice sessions and building habits around memorization, we can't really expect ourselves to get better at it. And the last and maybe most daunting challenge of music memory is being really thorough in our memory. And this is something I can attest to really personally. Some of you guys might already know this, but I have kind of a unique, albeit pretty useless degree in mandolin music performance. I went to a small liberal arts school in Tennessee and they kind of let me carve my own path and build my own curriculum. But before then in high school, I was looking around for other colleges that would let me use the mandolin as my main instrument. And there were only a few, but I ended up landing a scholarship audition at a school up in North Carolina went up there, had to play in front of a panel of judges, in front of families of other students who were competing for this scholarship. It was absolutely awful. <laughs> and one of the pieces I learned and memorized for the audition was that Bach G minor presto from the first violin sonata. You know, wanted to be like Chris Thiele, who doesn't? And uh, I figured leading up to the audition, if I could play through the piece a thousand times from memory, I'd be ready for the audition. And that's what I did, believe it or not. I got a whiteboard, started making tick marks every time I played through the piece. It took about a month, but I played through it a thousand times. And when I came to play it at the audition, crashed and burned. I couldn't make it past the first few measures because I was so intimidated, so anxious. 
I couldn't even remember how the song went. Pretty harrowing experience. I think I just played like a 5-1 to end it and took a bow and sat down. And thankfully that didn't happen at every audition I went to. So I was able to get a degree and move on with my life. But looking back now, it definitely taught me a lesson. I think I was only relying basically on one type of memory back then, which is muscle memory. And I think that's probably the most fickle of all types of memory. And now I've kind of learned that there's basically four different types of memory that we have in music. And the more that you utilize those different categories, the more thorough your memory is going to be. So let's take a look at each. And first up is auditory memory. And this would probably be the first thing that we think about when we think of music memorization. If we don't know how the music sounds, then we shouldn't expect ourselves to be able to play it, but it often gets overlooked. If you're coming from more of a classical background, I know there are some people in that world who say that you shouldn't listen to a recording of a piece of music that you're learning before you learn it something about it, you know, tainting your own interpretation of the music or something like that. But I think that's a load of rubbish. You can learn so much from listening to other people play music. And if you listen to it and get the music in your head, it's gonna be so much easier to figure out where you need to place your fingers on the fretboard afterwards. I know there's tons of folks on the mandolin who learn how to sing or how to hum a melody first before they pick up the instrument to learn it. Once you do that, your fingers just kind of automatically know where to go because you have this internal roadmap for how things should sound. The second category here is visual memory, and this could maybe take a couple different avenues. And one way of utilizing this visual aspect of our memory is to almost take a mental snapshot of the sheet music that you're using to learn the tune. And I have no photographic memory by any stretch of that phrase, but I do sometimes visualize the music in front of me when I'm playing something from memory. Sometimes just seeing the, the block phrase links or the amount of measures that you have in each sections, where the chords fit above the melody, the repeat signs, the rehearsal marks, things like that can really help me organize the music inside my head and keep myself straight when I'm playing things from memory. Or another avenue that this visual memory could take would be to visualize what's going on with your left hand on the fretboard. Think about what fingers you're using on what frets, on what strings at all times. And if you can see the melody unfold on the fretboard like that, you have another internal reference point. The third and maybe most overlooked form of musical memory is your analytical memory, or some people might call it your theoretical memory, which means understanding the greater music theory concepts that are underlying the music that you're playing to make it sound the way that it does. For example, here on the channel, we recently looked at a fun bluegrass and old time fiddle tune called The Methodist Preacher. You can check out the full lesson up here in the cards above, but let's just take a look at this tune and see how there's maybe a few analytical principles that would help us understand this tune better and memorize it more thoroughly. First up for this tune, we're in the key of G major, and even just understanding your key center, your G major scale is gonna help you memorize this better because you're ruling out kind of the excess notes that we're not using for this song. And in this tune, we're not playing any notes outside of the key of G, so you can basically rule out any notes that fall in the cracks of the G major scale. Understanding the time signature for your song is really important as well. Here we're in 4-4, so there's four beats in the measure. But even more helpful for memorization is just understanding the form and the structure of the song first. So here in Methodist Preacher, we have four different sections, A, B, C, D. They're each four measures long. All of them repeat except for the B section. And even just knowing that's gonna give you a huge leg up on memorizing this thing. But even if you look a little deeper in the song, you can see that there's a phrase structure going on where you have a two measure question phrase, which is followed by a two measure answer phrase, which brings some consonants and some resolution to that musical idea. That's something that happens throughout this entire tune and it's something that you can identify in all sorts of music. The phrase lengths may differ, it may not always be two measures each, but there's usually a question and an answer that you have in most of Western music. But lastly, on the analytical side, maybe the most important thing here is understanding how the melody and the harmony work together. The melody doesn't happen arbitrarily. All these notes happen in a song for a reason. And you can see this laid out most clearly by basically identifying and labeling all the chord tones that happen in a melody throughout the entire tune. This is something I actually had to do in school quite a lot. I remember in music theory, we had to analyze a lot of four-part Bach chorales, and those chorales didn't have any you know, chord notation above the sheet music. You just had to label all the different notes, align them in triad order, figure out what chords were happening, and label all the non-chord tones, and try to explain why they were there and how they functioned outside the chord. And that's a lot of work. You don't necessarily have to do that with a tune like Methodist Preacher, but even understanding your chord tones for your G major chord and identifying where those chord tones happen in this melody can give you a huge rooting in the theory behind what's going on. Even just this first measure of this tune, right? It's happening over a G major chord. And if you know your G major chord tones are G, B, and D, then you can easily identify, okay, we're just sliding up to a G major double stop here. We have a D and a B note, 
And then the last two notes of that measure are B and G again. So we're not playing anything besides chord tones. And this tune is pretty much G major all the way through. There's not a lot of chord interest, but usually when a tune changes chords, the melody also highlights those chord tones from that new chord in order to let the listener know what the harmony changes. So that's a big one. Analytical memory has a lot of different implications for how we memorize things. See if you can try a few of these ideas out. And the last category we mentioned before, of course, is muscle memory, which definitely is fickle, but also is really important too. If you don't have that muscle memory built up by that incessant repetition of a song, then you're not gonna have the same connection and the same familiarity with the tune that you would otherwise. And maybe it's not the best idea to try to play through the piece of music a thousand times and make ticks on the whiteboard like I did, but it can be helpful to set kind of a numerical goal for yourself to play through a tune like five times a day or something like that just to keep yourself accountable to having a lot of contact with the piece of music that you're working on. So those are the four categories, right? We have auditory memory, we have visual memory, we have analytical memory and muscle memory. But now let's actually grab our mandolin and see how we can use these four categories to our advantage to help us play things better. And thinking in these terms, one of the things that's been most helpful for me is trying to deprive myself of one of these types of memory so that the other memory will rise to meet the challenge. You know, it's almost like you're depriving yourself of one of your senses so that the other is compensate for the difference. So auditory memory to start with, right? What if we were to remove the auditory aspect of our memory altogether so that we can focus on the other aspects? And that sounds kind of weird, right? Like how could you play a piece of music without hearing it? And the only way that I know how to do that is to play with just your left hand and not your right hand. You still hear a little hint of those notes as your left hand hits the strings, but it definitely doesn't have the same context as using your right hand. It feels so different, and I find this really, really challenging to do. This is something I picked up from Katarina Lichtenberg. I'm sure you know she's an amazing classical mandolin player, and she told me that she used to do this a lot when she was working on those Bach violin sonatas and partitas. So she would play through those crazy movements, do all these amazing left hand things without really hearing what it sounded like with her right hand. And that's how she tested herself to actually know she'd memorize the pieces. Next, what if you were to remove your visual aspect of your playing? And this one's maybe a little bit more obvious, but have you ever tried playing blindfolded or with your eyes closed or in a dark room? It's a totally different experience, right? It's hard. <laughs> Next, analytical memory. And this one's a little tricky because you can't really stop just understanding the way that a piece of music works once you know how it works. And uh, the only thing I've found that kind of comes close to it is just practicing in front of the TV. If you can just zone out while you're playing, watch TV and not really think about what's going on, you're focusing more on those other aspects of your memory like the auditory, the visual, and the muscle. I've opened up a terrible world of possibilities saying it's okay to play in front of the TV, so uh, forgive me. <laughs> and lastly, muscle memory. It's another weird one. How do you remove the physical aspect of your experience playing the music. And this one's a bit of a trippy one. I picked this idea from a great book that I've mentioned before, The Musician's Way by Gerald Clickstein. And it's an idea called mental imaging that he talks about pretty early on in the book. There's this great quote from a pianist named Arthur Rubinstein who says, when I sit in Paris in a cafe surrounded by people, I don't sit casually. I go over a certain sonata in my head and discover new things all the time. <laughs> And that might sound like absolute craziness to some people, but it's something I've tried quite a lot, where I'll just sit my mandolin face down in my lap, I'll close my eyes and just think about the piece that I'm trying to memorize, see if I can play it through in my head without that physical reference point. And while you're doing that, you're trying to encapsulate all those other aspects of memory inside your head, without the mandolin, and that's really hard, right? You're trying to hear how the music sounds, you're seeing your fingers on the fretboard on what strings on what frets, you're understanding what's going on, the chord progression, and seeing how the form works analytically. It's pretty trippy. And the first time I tried this, I found it incredibly difficult. You know, I could play the piece of music with the mandolin in hand, but as soon as I put the mandolin down and tried to play it in my head, I would get lost really easily. I'd have to slow down in my brain on certain sections, which sounds, you know, kind of weird or I just wouldn't really remember things at all. So what I found was helpful was pulling out a metronome to keep me tied to some sense of reality and seeing if I could just go through the piece phrase by phrase from memory in my head. And when I did that for the entire piece, I had such a thorough memory of this. This is probably maybe the most valuable tip I could give you is to see if you could mentally image an entire piece of music like this. You know, muscle memory is a very linear form of memory because you really only know where you are in the present. You can kind of see a few notes ahead, maybe a few notes behind, but if you get thrown off, it's really hard to get back on track because you don't know where you should be. But if you have this mental map of the entire piece, you can play the whole thing in your brain, then it really does give you an overhead perspective of what's going on. You can see where you're starting, where you're gonna end up, and if you get off track, it's much easier to recalculate and get back to where you need to be. So try all those different memory deprivation exercises, but just for fun, here at the end, I wanna give you a few extra bonus memorization tips. 
And bonus tip number one is memorize from the very beginning. I'm sure you can kind of pick up this theme through the entire video, but the idea is that the sooner you can wean yourself away from the sheet music or from the recording, the better. So here's what I'd recommend. After playing through the tune, maybe once or twice, so you get the general lay of the land of the melody, where the chord changes are, the form, the structure, all that stuff. Stop right there and start memorizing. I know it seems like a lot of extra work there at the start, but if you start memorizing from this point in your learning process, you're gonna be memorizing it much faster and much more permanently because you're engaging with the material at a deeper level from the very start. Bonus tip number two is to break things up into bite-sized chunks and start with the first one. So for a fiddle tune like Methodist Preacher, it makes sense to organize your memorization into two measure phrases. So as soon as you start memorizing, start with that first two measures and don't allow yourself to go any further until you have those two measures down. Along those same lines, bonus tip number three is to use something I like to call the rule of three. This is a challenge I know a lot of folks use to help themselves stay more engaged and focused while they're memorizing. And and the idea is to see if you can just play through one of those two measure phrases three times in a row from memory without making a mistake. So for instance, if you're learning Methodist Preacher for the first time, take that first two measure phrase and do likewise. But let's say on the third time I make a mistake like that, I go a fret lower than I need to be. The idea is that you have to restart the count every time you make a mistake. And once you do the rule of three for the first phrase, you can do it for the next phrase. And then before moving on to the third, I like to back up to the first phrase and see if I can play the first two together three times in a row without making a mistake. Then the third phrase, and then the first three phrases together, the fourth phrase, four phrases together until you've worked through the entire tune. And if you can play through the entire tune three times in a row without making a mistake, that's a pretty good litmus test to see if you actually have the tune memorized. And by adding that extra sense of weight or cost to what you play, I think it really helps you memorize things a lot faster. And it doesn't have to be the rule of three. I've heard Charlie Parker did the rule of 21 back in the day, but who on earth has time for that, right? <laughs> Tip number four is to change your environment while you're memorizing. This one's a little bit weird, but there's been studies that have shown that students who study in different locations leading up to a test end up remembering the material better. So. Same idea for music. What if you learn the A section for tune in one room and then the B section in another room? Or you could even try, you know, standing for the A section and sitting for the B section or running up the stairs first and trying to remember the A section out of breath and then seeing if you can do the B section when you're really relaxed, you know, anything like that to really change the context of your experience of the tune. Tip number five is an interesting concept called back chaining. It's the idea of instead of starting with the beginning of the piece and memorizing towards the end, what if you start at the end of the piece and memorize your way towards the beginning? And you're not actually playing the piece backwards, right? All you're doing is you're starting with the last two measures, playing those forward, then backing up to the next two measures and the next two measures until you've got the entire piece. And I like this idea because usually we start out with the beginning of the piece and we know the A section really well or the first few measures really well. And as we get towards the end of the piece, it becomes more shaky because we haven't spent as much time with that material. So. You're kind of starting with the known, going to the unknown, and then back chaining is the opposite, where you're starting with the unknown, working your way towards the known part of the song. So that way you can kind of level out your experience with the entire piece. And the last tip here, I know some of you folks have probably been screaming this one at the top of your lungs for this entire video so far, but I just wanted to make you guys wait for it. But the last tip is to learn stuff by ear. You know, I think a recording can be just as much of a crutch as tablature or sheet music, but it can be a way of eliminating the middleman if you find yourself depending on that sheet music too much. When you learn something by ear, you probably import the track into the amazing Slowdowner or a similar app where you can slow things down without changing the pitch. And then you're just picking it out note by note, phrase by phrase, and basically memorizing it as you go along. And I know some people, as they do this, they'll write out the notes on tab or sheet music as they go along. But if you can restrain yourself from doing that, you'll be memorizing the piece of music from the start, which is amazing. And then afterwards, you won't have the temptation to come back to the page. You'll just have to remember it or come back to the recording and learn it again by ear and further cement your understanding of the piece. But all these tips are pretty one dimensional. I think just like those four different categories of music memory, you kind of have to try a lot of different things in order to get the fullest memorization of a piece of music. And memory is impermanent too, which is so sad because sometimes I'll learn a tune and forget it the next week and I'll have to go back and learn it again. But I kind of reassure myself that every time I relearn a piece of music, I'm learning it at a deeper level. I'm putting down roots in a deeper way so that next time I come to the tune later on, I'll remember it better. But that's it for this one. Thanks so much for watching and be sure to check out some of the other videos that you see here on screen. If you want some more mandolin content in your life, all those subscribes, likes go a long way and all the support over on our Patreon page is so appreciated. Thanks 
to all the patrons out there. Check it out in the link in the description below if you want those PDF transcriptions, backing tracks, melody recordings, all sorts of music that you can memorize. But until then, I'll see you in the next video very soon.